Hey folks, my name is Peter Odioni I'm excited about the opportunity to be live today. Uh, it's the 17th day of September in, magic, in the magical year 2023. And on a day as important as this, I'm live. We're actually um, trying to project the interpretation for what is happening today. It's happening in the world, it's happening among the nations, and most importantly, it's happening in the church that God has raised uh, as a witness. He has separated from the Gentiles for the glory of his name. I'm actually speaking um, today, uh, I want to say it's under the auspices of the sons of Issachar, those that understand times and seasons, and they know what the church ought to do. Now, in all that is happening in the world today, there is a there is a wisdom that the church should operate in. In all that we see happening in our system, systems of the world, today we see a lot of things happening in the entertainment system. We see a lot of things happening in the political system. We see a lot of things happening in the economic system. Many things are happening in the world. But you see, it becomes very important for us to have the ministry of the sons of Issachar. I mean people that have interpretation. People that have understanding, people that have uh, insight into the events that are happening. You see, many a times I've spoken about the collapse of the Western civilization, and I've also projected what is coming just beyond the fall of the Western Antichrist. I've looked at something that is imminent in among the nations, is emergent even right now. The kings from the east, they are rising. And the kings from the east are rising. Um, they have given expression to their identity as the BRICS nations. They have given expression to their identity as the coalition of kings, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. And we're seeing how they are going across the nations, lobbying, lobbying for other nations to join their company. You see, many of us see things like this happening, but you see, it's important for us to recognize that the things that are happening in our physical world, things that are happening in our world, they have a spiritual connotation. So it becomes important for, especially for God's people, to have the ministry of an interpreter. The ministry of an interpreter is so important even now because as we are giving interpretation to the rise of the kings from the east, we are also looking at another dimension, another layer of interpretation that's tied to the evolution the evolution of the body of Christ. You see, over the years we have, if you are conversant with church history, you would have noticed how the body of Christ has evolved over the years. We have actually seen a body of a body that was united in one accord in the early times. Soon after this, Roman Empire tra tra trampled on it brought persecution our way and above all infiltrated it by the rise of the Catholic Church. And then we begin to see the evolution of what uh, became of the body of Christ. Because right from then, the body of the Antichrist began to, how do I say it now? They began to be propagated among the nations. And then um, after the Roman Catholic Church came, we uh, we saw the Protestant Reformation that gave birth to the Protestant Church. And then you see the Evangelicals, the Baptists, the um, Anglican. You can you now come to see the Pentecostal, all of which have given expression to the man of sin. All of this has given expression to the son of perdition. Everything that speaks for organized religion today is but the incarnation of the beast. That's exactly what I'm teaching here. So it becomes important for us to understand by discernment who is being produced in all of what we are doing? Are we the remnant church who um, the Lord has left for himself as a witness? Or we have become the afterwards church? Why do I say the afterwards church? We, we recognize that there is a pattern that God has adopted to take a harvest from the earth. In um, I think that scripture is First Corinthians. Let me see it now. Mm. I think it's 1 Corinthians. No. 
Let me see Second Corinthians chapter 5. I'm sure it is one of those scriptures. Because we begin to see, okay, good, that is it. We begin to see an order. An order, there is an order. Oh. Just a minute. Mm, it's First Corinthians fifteen. First Corinthians fifteen. No, I don't want to use NIV. I gotta use the KJV. Okay. Thank you, Father, for light and revelation, for your word. We are looking at your word today. We ask that you have your way today. Teach us and open to us these things that you have ordained for us to see even today in the name of the Lord Yeshua. I want to read first verse 22 of um, 1 Corinthians 15. It says, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his order, there is an order. Christ the first fruits, afterwards, they that are Christ at his coming. So you see, this particular line of scripture actually has defined the order with which God will take his harvest from the earth. You know, God is a farmer now. I'm looking at God as a farmer. He has sown a seed and he takes a harvest. But the harvest of the seed that he has sown will be taken in an order. First, you will see Christ, the first fruit. I want to believe we are looking at the first expression of the church before the falling away. I want to believe here we are seeing the first expression of the church that was valiant, moving among the nation with the Great Commission. And then there is a season called the afterwards. I believe that's the season where we are today. We are in the season of the afterwards, and in this time, you saw the man of sin rise, and you begin to see the man of sin promote his system, producing his religio-political world order. And we have seen this world order evolve over the years. The world order, the Roman world order, we have seen it evolve over the years. We begin to see a western flare, and now we begin to see an eastern flare right now. You see, all of this is the afterwards season that this scripture talks about. We are looking at how God has ordained to make a harvest of Christ on the earth. We are seeing two, two sides now. We are seeing Christ the first fruits, and then we are seeing those that are Christ that is coming. You understand? After this season of afterwards, we are going to see those that are Christ. At his coming. When I mean Christ, those that belong to Christ, those that are Christ's body at his coming. So there is something important that is happening even now. Christ, God is in the business of de defining those that are Christ's at his coming. It's very important. I'm coming into the, the river of today's conversation now, coming into, into, into the mainstream of today's conversation. We are looking at the definition of those that are Christ's at his coming. Those that are Christ's possession at his coming. Those that are Christ's wife at his coming. And it becomes very important for us to recognize that, you see, by interpretation, we know when the time comes for us to define that it's a company, those that are Christ at his coming. And uh, more importantly, we must know where the influence or where the, the, the timing of that afterward season ends or extends to. You see, after we saw Christ the first fruit with the early church, we are seeing an afterward season. And in this season, we see the Roman Catholic Church and the Protestant Church give expression to the person of the Antichrist. And you see, after this season, we are coming into another era of those that are Christ at his coming so you want to put the harvest that god is taking out of the earth into consideration 
we are seeing two main harvests. The first one is Christ, the first fruits, and then the, the, the next one is those that are Christ at his coming. Very important. I want us to ensure that we are part of these two houses. There are two houses, but they are um, they are descriptive or instructive or uh, definitive of how God wants to harvest Christ on the earth. Christ the first fruits and those that are Christ that is coming. You see, it is important we recognize that we are playing a vital part in these two stories. The production of Christ the first fruits and those that are Christ at the end, at his coming. So we must understand what characterizes these two individuals. We are looking at the cultivation of Christ here. We are looking at the revelation of Yeshua Hamashiach here. It's important for us to recognize that the harvest that God has ordained to take out of the earth is the same seed that he planted in the beginning. The scripture says that um, seed time and harvest, as long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest shall not cease. Now, many of us begin to, to think this conversation is about the law of karma or the law of sowing and reaping. But it goes beyond talking about sowing and reaping. God has told us that he is a farmer and he has planted a seed. His son, the son of God, um, he actually did that with the intent to harvest the harvest of the seed that he planted. He wants to get the son of man. And the son of man is gotten in an order. First, you see Christ, the first fruits. And after an era, after a season, you are going to see those that are Christ's at his coming. So it's important to define the, the, the forces that are in operation when these incarnations are ongoing. You see that era of the afterward season, we are seeing the incarnation of the man of sin. It's not the church that is produced then. And why do I say it's not the church that is produced then? I found, um, I found um, some scripture in Daniel chapter 8. Many other scriptures that speaks about the man of sin, the son of perdition, the little horn. I found that he will rise and overthrow the, the truth. He will overthrow the truth. So we are in that era where the, where the, where the truth is overthrown. We are in that era where um, truth is cast to the ground. And that's the time that you see we see the world in the state that it is in. A religio-political conditioning that is giving expression to the Antichrist helping everybody see the system of the beast. And ultimately, this afterward season kind of mutes the cultivation of Christ. In all of you, what you see, you see the cultivation of Christians. You see Christians in their droves going out after their religion. But you see, what we, are, what we don't see in the world today is the cultivation of Christ. If the cultivation of Christ is ongoing, the world will be little. If the cultivation of Christ is ongoing, the kingdom of God will preach to towns. If the cultivation of Christ is all ongoing, scriptures of the prophets will be uh, being fulfilled, will be fulfilled day in and day out. If the cultivation of Christ is, is um, ongoing, the will of God the Father will be done on the earth through you and I. If the cultivation of Christ is ongoing, you and I, believers across the world, will not be seeing themselves as Christians. We will actually be seeing ourselves as new manifestations, new incarnations of Christ. We will be more discerning. Very important for us to recognize that. So in all that we are talking about today, we are talking about the revelation of Christ. The two stages, the two others, the other, the two components of the revelation of Christ over the period that I want to call the period of the harvest, where God is taking a harvest of his son. We are seeing Christ the first fruit and those that are Christ that is coming. Now, those that are Christ that is coming, is important for us to unpack them. Let's review this one. Those that are Christ that is coming are those that understand that their lives have become a prophetic experience that God has given to the world. Those that are Christ that is coming ultimately are those that recognize their place of submission to Christ. And that's exactly where the Lord is beginning to tell us to happen. What well, is supposed to happen, the fact that the church has become the wife. The, the church is the wife of the last man. And the church will have come to a place of submission. We have come to a place where we recognize that we are his bone and his flesh. 
very important. I've always been looking at this particular scripture from time, from time, from a couple of months or even years now. But I begin to see United Israel, Second Samuel chapter 5. I begin to see a united Israel. And allow me to tell you that all you see in the scriptures, this is one thing I want to harp on. All you see in the scriptures, when I mean the scriptures, I mean from Genesis down to Malachi. And you could also want to add the Apocrypha books. Everything you see in scriptures testifies of Christ. Everything you see in the scriptures actually tell you about Christ. It actually talks to Christ. And then when we are talking about Christ, we are looking at the one that was sown and the one that is the product of the sowing, the one that is harvested. When we are talking about Christ, we are talking about the Son of God, Christ the first fruits, and those that are His that is coming. So it is important to recognize that this is one expression of Christ, but it is in different people. One expression. So you are seeing one character. You are seeing one man. You are seeing one person. You are seeing one son of God, but you are seeing him incarnated in multitudes of people who believe this message that I'm preaching. Now, when you, when you look at the scriptures, you are actually looking at the life and times of Christ. I want you to look at it like that. When you are looking at the story of David, you are looking at the life and times of Christ. Be it Christ the head or Christ the body. So it's important for us to recognize that whenever you see like this that talks about the unity of Israel, you will also see that there is an error in the church age for Christ to be united. I want to believe that's the error that we have come into right now. One of our East scripture, scriptural texts that we are looking at is Second Samuel chapter chapter five. And what happened in Second Samuel chapter five? I want to just read here and I thank God for, for revelation in the name of the Lord Yeshua. Now between verse 1 and verse 3, you see the elders of Israel recognized David as king over Israel. The elders recognized. So they got to a time that they recognized. So the unity of the house of Israel is captured when the elders recognized that David is king. That was when the unity of the church the unity of Israel, I beg your pardon, began to be a concern, it began to be the subject matter, it began to be the main cause. Now, this scripture points to Christ. So we are looking at the unity of the body of Christ and we are happening on the time that the elders recognize that Yeshua is king. Very important. The elders began to recognize that Yeshua is king. So we're looking at everybody coming to terms with the kingship of Christ. You see, that's a crucial time that we are in. And that's where those that belong to Christ that is coming, those that are Christ that is coming, that's where they are defined. So we'll see the order that God wants to take a harvest. Christ the first fruits, they operated in all the Roman Empire and were killed. That's before the falling away of the church. You begin to see that these ones, they recognized that Christ was king. That's why they were killed. That's why they were fed to lions. That's why the, uh, the Roman Empire, after a long time of persecuting these ones, the Roman Empire infiltrated them. Why? Because they recognized that Christ is king. When Christ is king, they are now responsive to the Great Commission. These ones, they have a sense of responsibility to ensure that Christ is king over their land. So it's not just Christ being king over the church. Christ is also the king of the kings of the nations. So you must not be carried away with the lies that many people say Jesus is Lord, but they really do not move within their nations to ensure that Christ is indeed obeyed as a matter of national policy. But you see, when Christ is being harvested off the earth, my God, you are going to see a people that are particular about the kingship of Yeshua. And now, here is what happened. I'm looking at 
our future in the unfolding of Christ. And you see, what is imminent now is the unity of the body of Christ. What is imminent now is the definition of those that are Christ's at his coming. And we want to define these people as the wife of Christ. And here's that this, this definition in scripture, the scriptures that testifies of Christ. So you see, in the ministration of the New Testament, you see somebody who is dishing out old and dishing out new. Do you see it here? The person is dishing out old and the person is dishing out new. And the, you are seeing corroborative claims between the old and the new that establishes Christ on his throne. Do you understand? Remember the uh, scripture that says a good, a skilled preacher of the New Testament is like somebody that brings vessels old and new. My God, I'll check that scripture. But this is what you are seeing in this particular life. You are seeing the ministration of uh, a son of God. And we are actually seeing how the new relates to the old. We are seeing, on the other hand, how the old relates to the new. What are we looking at now? In the evolution of Christ, the emergence of the body of Christ, that's where the, those that are he that is coming will be defined. You are actually seeing something that points us back to the scripture. And this is where we become skillful ministers of the New Testament. We can find out in scriptures where the unfolding of Christ relates to. My God, we saw it when the church is born in Acts chapter 2 and verse 15. We see a people being incarnated by the Holy Ghost, a people being inspired by the Holy Ghost. They were agitated at that time because they just received the outpouring of the Spirit. And they began to bring fulfillment to Scripture. It was a Peter who got up with the eleven and said, These men are not drunk. This is that, that, that Joel. So right there, you saw an interpreter. Right there, you saw one skilled in the ministry and ministration, the New Testament ministration. And in this man, you begin to see somebody that is pointing onlookers to a scripture that is being fulfilled. Now, what are we talking about? We're talking about the definition of Christ's body. So we want to go back to the Old Testament, 2 Samuel chapter 5, where we begin to see the imminent, we begin to see um, what I want to call, um, it's a, it's a pointer, it's something that points to the imminence of the unity of the body of Christ. We've gotten to the era where the body of Christ is united, not by a denominational affiliation. We are seeing unity now that is tied to the throne of our Messiah. Unity now that is tied to the throne of Yeshua Kamashiach. Let me read. Then all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron. They came to a location. All the tribes, all of them, there was no tribe left out. All the tribes came to David at Hebron and spoke. That means all of them had one declaration. From their mouths, all of them said one thing. What did they say? Saying, Indeed, we are your bone and your flesh. My God, my God. These ones, all of them had one word. Saying, Indeed, of a truth, we are your bone and your flesh. This is the statement they made to David. They recognized their identity as David's bone and your f and flesh. You see, it's important for us to look at this particular um, dimension of self-identity. You know, some scriptures will say that these people say we are your tribe's men. But you see, being a tribe's man, it goes deeper. Um, uh, being the, the, uh, the uh, making this declaration. We are your bone and your flesh goes deeper than just being a tribe's man. Let's take the root of this their statement back to the beginning. Let's go to the root of this statement. Uh, I think that was in Genesis chapter 4. Genesis 
behold, we are thy bone and thy flesh. What happened in Genesis chapter 4? Genesis chapter chapter two. We're trying to look for the origin of the new name that the tribes of Israel had. You see, when they became when the time came for Israel to be united, they recognized themselves in a new way. Genesis chapter two. I want to read from verse 18. And the Lord said, It is not good for that man should be alone. I will make him and help me. It is not good that man should be alone. Now, I want you to also look at this scripture because you cannot just interpret it in another way. This scripture testifies of Christ. So if you see where God is saying about Adam, it is not good that man should be alone. I want you to see that this is what he's saying about Christ. It is not good that Christ, man, should be alone. Do you remember, except a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it abides alone? So you see, the aloneness of man is a condition that requires the presentation of his wife. It's because of the aloneness of man that God wants to multiply him. My God, thank you, Father. It is because of the aloneness of man that God wants to bring him a wife. All right. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. So in, this, in, 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 the, in the quest to, to, to discover a, 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 a meat, a help meat for Adam, God went down to the ground and brought out animals to see what, what Adam would name them. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found and help meat for him. You see the goal? God wanted to produce a help that is meat for Adam. Yes. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. So you begin to look at the sleeping of Adam here as the dead bear resurrection of Christ. The sleeping of Adam here is the dead bear resurrection, the death of Christ. Do you see it? And he took out of his ribs and closed up the flesh thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man he made he a woman and brought her unto the man. So after the surgery, there was a presentation that God made to the man. And Adam said, right then, Adam's, the man's name changed, his humanity changed. And then God began to recognize Adam. Because before then it was man, but until the wife is separated from him, Stop being man. He became Adam. Something happened there. So we are seeing the identity of the Son of God. We are seeing it right there. The identity of the Son of God. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. You see, before then it was a rib taken out of the sides of the man. And immediately man became Adam. The rib, the whatever was formed out of the rib became woman. Why? Because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. So we're looking at the oneness of flesh here, the oneness of bone here. That's the one of the things that defines those that are Christ 
as is coming, they have come into the knowledge of the, their oneness with Christ. And you see, the scripture actually holds this knowledge from the side of the woman. You see, it was Adam that recognized this woman. Oh, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. I'll call her woman because she proceeded out of me. She came out of me. But in the scripture that we just read, 2 Samuel chapter 5, all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron, saying, Behold, we are thy bone and thy flesh. So there's a, there's a rewiring of their mentality concerning their identity. And then they begin to see who they are indeed. And that's one of the things that I would say is a prerequisite for the unity of the body of Christ. It's one of the things that you should look out to for those that are Christ that is coming. They are Christ's, Christ's body, Christ's poten- um, property, Christ's wife, Christ's Eve. So what we are looking at today in the incarnation of the Son of Man where you must define Christ, the Son of the living God. By so doing, you get to define the church, the foundation of the church. We are seeing the people that are Christ's flesh and bone. That means they have come into the oneness of flesh with Christ. They have come into the oneness of bone with Christ. So, you see, there's nothing that separates them from the incarnation, the personation of Christ. This is where God wants us to attain, even now. Because until we attain that realm where Christ and us have become one flesh, we will not be able to continue the ministry, the body ministry of Christ. You see, those that are Christ that is coming, we are the ones that continue the body ministry. So Christ has a body ministry. That's what I want us to recognize today. And Christ's body ministry is also a scripture fulfilling condition, a scripture fulfilling experience. It's in Christ's body ministry that we are seeing the trees of righteousness defined. It's in Christ's body ministry we are seeing the mountain of the Lord's house exalted at the tops of the mountain. We are seeing judgment come out of Zion. Judgment of the nations come out coming out of Zion, the body ministry of Christ. So I begin to talk about the unity of the body of Christ. I'm talking about the definition of those that are Christ that is coming. And ultimately, we're looking at the people that have allowed Christ to have his body ministry through them. Very important. It's important we give Christ his right to live today and continue the doing and the completing of the will of the Father and the works of the Father respectively. It's very important we recognize that. That two has become one flesh. So you don't talk to the believer the things you cannot talk to Christ. That's a new day. So allow me announce today that it's a new day. It's a new day in that the focus of our ministry has changed. We are no longer trying to minister to Christians as the afterward season typified. You know, in the afterward season, you saw the Antichrist incarnating himself. And then the ministry that God has for the nations by the incarnation or through the incarnation of Christ. Hebrews chapter 1, the scripture says, God has always spoken in sundry time through prophets. But now he speaks through his son. And his son has a wife. His son has a body. His son has those that are his that is coming. And his son is moving among the nation, doing one thing, preaching the kingdom of God. Do you understand what I'm saying? The incarnation of Christ is what we are looking at. And Christ has become the least of the brethren. Allow me announce to you, beloved, that we have entered a new era. You know, today is the first year of the uh, Jewish New Year, 5784. Five, and it's indicated that we have entered a new era. Some days ago, the Lord began to talk to me about the unity of the body of Christ. We are talking about the conversations that tie around the unity of the body of Christ. We are looking at the order that God has the harvest of his son on earth. Those that are Christ at his coming, they they, they they, they come later after an era, an era just after 
the Christ, the first fruits have been manifest in the world. That's exactly what God is doing. So we're trying to define the, the realm where those that are Christ that is coming are found, where they are defined. The realm where Christ is nurtured is a realm where Christ is ministered to. Very important. So it's also subtle because many people are going through their Christian arrangements. Many of them are looking for a way out of the decadence of the world. That's why Christianity is being propagated and it is tied to the incarnation of the man of sin. That afterwards period, Christ is not nurtured. That afterwards period, scriptures are not fulfilled. That afterwards period, everything that has to do with doing the will of God on the earth is is um, relegated to the back. You see, that afterwards period is the period that we have been running through just before this house of um, Israel, the tribes of Israel, came together to Hebron. They had been under a degenerative era for Christ. It's a degenerative era because Christ is not nurtured. So you begin to see where Christ begins to say, I was hungry, you gave me food, you, you did not give me food. Matthew 25, you see there are two types of people, there's the sheep and the goats. For the goats, there were people who didn't take care of Christ. Why? Because they were products of that afterwards era. Christ was not the focus, Christians were the focus. So Christ was left to starve, Christ was left to be hungry, Christ was left to be destitute, living in caves. So Right now, begin to help us see the, the, the struggle between the house of Saul and the house of David. The house of Saul represents the incarnation of the Antichrist during the afterwards era. And then the house of David, on the other hand, represents the incarnation of Christ during the era of the unity of the body of Christ. So we begin to see the animosity between the house of Saul and the house of David. And how do you see it when you begin to project this message of the kingdom and our oneness with Christ, you will be attacked. You will be attacked. You will actually be attacked because whatever you are saying is against, is running against the thread. Whatever you are saying is running against the uh, traditional system. You will be called a heretic. You will be hated. Why? Because you have... Set your affection on Christ. And you have put Christ where you want to see Christ. As the least of the brethren. It's a very interesting place to be. Very prophetic place to be. And that's the place that will become renowned in the days ahead. It's the place where Christ is nurtured. The place where Christ is, is um, cultivated. We're looking at the cultivation of Christ. We're looking at the nurturing of Christ. Important. Very important. But we also look at something here, that when the house of Saul was running things, we begin to see a Christianity that is just what we have always been running. The Christianity that doesn't have a sense of responsibility to nation building or community discipleship, nation, national discipleship. Nation building is same as national discipleship. And that's why we have had a humongous followership with the Christian family businesses today that they call their churches. And then you see increasing uh, disregard for how the government will be, how the government will be administered, how the nations will be administered. That's why you have it just the way it is today. The word of the Lord does not come out from the presence of God anymore in much of the Christian arrangements. The nation has been separated. You see, there's a separation of church and state. So the affairs of the nation have been separated from the church. And the Christian church owners are comfortable with it. They are good by just facing their own Christian congregation. You see, the, the Christianity system is set up to give a better life to Christians at the expense of the nations that are left in the hand of the wicked ones. You see, there is a, a general knowledge here that God is not concerned with the affairs of the state. And that's how we have come to a time 
that God is not concerned with our education. He's not concerned with our entertainment. He's not concerned with the way we get married. He's not concerned. He's not concerned. He's not concerned with the culture that is propagated in, among the nations. And this has gone on despite the proliferation of our churches. We now want to see why is this the case? Why we had a largely heavily followed um, Christian church system from the Catholic through the Anglicans, all the Protestant units, down to our Pentecostal churches. Why is it that we have had large systems at the expense of good governments? And you have seen it. This is how the churches have become big and then the nations have fallen from one level of decadence to another. And this is all that typifies the house of Saul. You remember something that when David finally um, experienced all the tribes coming to meet him at Hebron, the scripture tells us that the elders, the elders in the camp came to meet David and David entered a league with them. And in Hebron, they declared that David is their king. That was the first time David got kingship in Israel. It's Hebron that made him king first. But we begin to see that before this time, before this time, the house of Saul ran a government. And then the ark of covenant of the Lord our God was not in Israel. All the while Saul was in government, the ark of covenant, something that signifies the presence of God, was with the Philistines. I want to give you another example. Saul, each time he wanted to consult with God, he had to leave his throne. He went out of the nation of Israel and went to an area called Nawet Ramah to meet Samuel. Saul did not have a place of meeting for God in the Israel that he governed. How do I mean a place of meeting for God? It's not that Saul did not have religious mountains where people were meeting. Yes, there were many religious mountains where people were meeting, but there was no ark. There was no ark of covenant. There was no definite place to meet with God and get revelation for the government of the nation. That's one thing that typifies the house of Saul. There are many churches quite all right. But the presence of God is lacking in this place. The presence of God, the power of God, where the voice of a king exists is lacking. That's how you have seen our churches go in leaps and bounds. But our nations, they do not hear the voice that we get in the place of worship. Access to the Holy of Holies has not been defined. That's why our nations have been allowed to go the way they have gone. All of this is, the, is tied to the profanity of the house of Saul. The Ark of Covenant of the Lord our God was with the Philistines. The place to hear from God where Prophet Samuel was, was outside their dom where they were domiciled. Do, do you imagine this? And then Jerusalem, which is God's end time real estate, earmarked by God for end time demonstration of the things that pertain to the incarnation of those that are Christ's at his coming, was left in the hands of strangers. Jebusites were inhabitants of the land. And these Jebusites, they actually put lepers and blind men at the entrance to the city of Jerusalem. My goodness, you see how the stench of the house of Saul actually rose. In their eyes, they want to do ministry by themselves. They want to be in charge of it all. 
and they have sons that are trying all the abners of this world, the sons of Saul, Absalom, and the rest that have been that are trying to impose themselves to continue that antichrist order. There are things that happen. There are things that are happening. There are things that have been happening. But you see, all of that ends with the house of Saul. All of that ends with the house of Saul. After the house of Saul falls, which we see in 2 Samuel chapter 3, what we look at is the rise of the house of David. I want us to stick with these scriptural verses, 2 Samuel chapter 5. We want to put our hearts on this text. We want to hold on to it. We want to try to keep the commandments of God in this regard. Meditate on it. Look at all the openings, how things have happened. And most importantly, you must have a, a prophetic outlook in the studying of the scripture. You must look through these events and begin to see the incarnation of Christ. You must see how they point to Christ and then define your responsibility in Christ. In Christ, we're not just called to become Christians, live the life, the good life, and die and go to heaven. No, 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 no. The call that God has given us is an eternal, glorious call. It's eternal and it's glorious. It's an eternally glorious call. It's a gloriously eternal call. And this call is shrouded around the incarnation of Christ. Then we become God-ordained people. Then we become scripture-fulfilling people. Then we become Holy Spirit-inspired people. That's the witness that God has left on the earth. Hence, the propagation of his gospel. The gospel of God that has been foretold by scriptures of old, but now is being revealed in our time. As Christ in us, the hope of glory, is what will define us as those that are Christ's at his coming. Most importantly, we are taking our place with the house of Saul. The house of Saul represents a new system. The house of, uh, the house of David, I beg your pardon. We are taking our place in the house of David. And we recognize that the house of David represents the throne of Christ. The house of David represents an administration. Not just for the church. A new administration for the nations. The house of David represents a new priesthood. The house of David represents a new outlook. The house of David represents a new throne, the throne of the Messiah. The house of David represents a new, new day for the nations because it's when the house of David arises and then you find the Melchizedekian priests who are themselves kings of righteousness. That's when you see the things that God has ordained to happen in Zion, in the latter times. That's when you see us walk in them. We have this glorious heritage that God has ordained that we may walk in them. But it's, in the, it's under the auspices of the house of David that we receive the insight, revelation, understanding, graces to walk in them. There's so much to walk in concerning the incarnation of Christ. There's so much to walk in concerning the uh, manifestation of those that are Christ at his coming. It's very important. It's very important. Those that are Christ at his coming. I want to read this commentary here. <laughs> Let me read this commentary. Then all the tribes of Israel came to David. No, prior to this, only one of the tribes of Israel recognized David as king. The other tribes recognized the pretender king, Ishbosheth, a son of Saul. Do you understand? Ishbosheth was murdered in, as recorded in 2 Samuel 4. Joab, I think it was Joab that, met, that murdered him. So now the tribes turned to David. So until the pretender kings are murdered and taken out of the scene, 
the tribe may not turn to God. So right now, if you are studying this particular text, you want to imagine, what does the murdering of Ishbosheth stand for? What's the meaning of the murdering of Ishbosheth? Meditators, those that have the spirit of revelation, you want to probe into this because we want to actually know what the murdering of Ishbosheth represents in the incarnation of Christ. Okay. It is sad that tribes only turn to David when their previous choice was taken away. When their previous choice, that means they had another choice before they turned to David. They had another choice. They saw another option. When that choice was taken away, that was when the other tribes said they need to turn for David. Could this be that the one tribe that recognizes Christ as king is us? Because that's what our lives have been about. And we have been waiting for the entire house of Israel to come to terms with what we have been saying. Could it be that when what they have put their trust in has taken away, the son, that means there's an inheritance there, the son of Saul, it could be somebody that would take over one of these big ministries. But allow me to say something that has to do with the inheritance of all of these ministries is taken away. When the son, the one that continues their right to propagate themselves is taken away, the son is murdered. When their previous choice is taken away, mm, my God, they came back to David. It, on the same principle, it is sad that when Christians only finally recognize Jesus as king, when their other choices fail, that's when we should choose Yeshua outrightly, not just when other options fail. That's what this man is trying to say. In the incarnation of Christ, you have seen a people who have moved for kingdom. You have seen the large majority of the church reject everything about kingdom because they believe that Christ doesn't have right to reign on the earth, that Christ's government is in heaven, and when they die, they will go to heaven. You know, that's what they have been taught under the auspices of the house of Saul. But when they recognize that there was no road for them to go to heaven, and they recognize that what they have been doing has been taken away. So allow me to say, I could be pro prophesying from here, that is, it's in, we have come into the season where God is going to take away the platforms that many under the house of Saul have used. That is a sign to show that the house of Saul is falling when their platforms go away. And how does their platform go away? Same, in the same theme. We are talking about the unity of Israel, right? We are talking about the unity of the body of Christ. In the same vein, the Antichrist is going to move to ensure the unity of his own system. Whatever they are doing to foster the house of Saul, they will still think to move it. So you are going to be seeing an interfaith movement this new year. That will help us recognize the error of our ways with the practice of Christianity. The interfaith movement is going to take away the thrones that your GOs have set up. The interfaith movement is going to take away the system that you have trusted in. It's an inter interfaith movement that is coming that will place you worshipping a god, small letter G, with a pagan by your side. A Muslim on this side, a Jew behind you. I want you to find your place in that. If you find your place in that place, you know you are a body, you are the body, you make up the body of the beast. But if you cannot find your place in that place, the time to turn to David has come. The time to turn to Christ as your king has come. Do you understand? This is the premise that will predicate the turning of many back to King Yeshua Hamashiach.
They will turn when they see that there is no place for them worshipping the true God in the system of the beast. You see, the, 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 the house of King Saul represents everything about the system of the beast. The house of King Saul represents everything about the system of the beast. If you find that you don't have a place in that system, time to change the ship. Dump ship has come. It's a beautiful, um, it's a beautiful um, commentary here, and I will, I will read through it. I will read through it, and then in, in other times we will come and present the nuggets that I'm getting from this particular commentary. It was important that I read this thing today. The 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 the, the formation of those that are Christ that is coming. Is shrouded around the sustenance, continuation of the life of Christ. It's shrouded around the throne of Christ. It's shrouded around the production of the body, the wife of the last man. So we're recognizing our oneness with Christ. Then we're recognizing incarnating Christ by the grace of God, by the help of the Holy Ghost. Well, that's what we are looking at. That's where our focus is now. So instead of running the things that the house of Saul represented, which is breakthrough for Christians, many things that Christianity has represented, he that way, we now want to focus on Christ and see how we can nurture him in the body. Focus on Christ, nurture him in the body, propagate the realm where Christ is manifest in the world. And that realm is at the name of Yeshua. In that realm, Christ reigns over our communities. In that realm, the blind and the lame that are stayed in Jerusalem will be ousted. In that realm, the Ark of Covenant, the presence of God will be reinstated in Zion. In that realm, you will not need to travel out of your land to go to another city to go and hear God. Do you understand? You will not need to have permanent sight in one expressway and be expecting to, to go there before you hear God. All of that order has ended. It's a new day. It's a new day. It's a new day. I want to use this medium to talk to my people in my network. You see these three books? They are books that throw light on the message of the kingdom. The message that Christ preaches during his earthly ministry. I want you to get on Amazon. Get a copy of these books. The first one is a quest for global dominion. Now this is the first one. It's a quest for global dominance. And that's exactly what God has ordained to do. He wants to define the judgment of the earth for a thousand years. That's what he has always been about. The second one is the message of the kingdom. That's this one here, right here. It's the message of the kingdom. This is the message that Christ preaches during his earthly ministry. Be it Christ the head or Christ the body. So this message helps us see that the church, the ecclesia, is the continuation of the ministry of Christ. At the end of this book, you come to recognize the fourth definition of this gospel of the kingdom. The literal definition is a record of the God-ordained, Holy Spirit-inspired, scripture-fulfilling life of Christ during his earthly ministry. That's what God has given to us. This is what we must come to understand. In understanding this, we are coming to terms with the nurturing of the body of Christ. This book is written to the United Church, ultimately to cultivate Christ as the believer across the nation and stamp Christ's authority in the nations of the world, the governance of the nations of the world, so that at the end of the day, we will realize God's hope of producing sheep category nations, gospel church states that have been enthroned Christ. So ultimately, we see those that are Christ that is coming at those that have enthroned Christ. And the ministry of those people will produce nations that have enthroned Christ. 
So the transition is taking us from democracy to Christ compliant nations. The transition is taking us from socialism and social communism to Christ compliant nations. So we are seeing a, a transli transition among the nations as Christ is nurtured in the body. That's why God has ordained for us to write this book at this time. I want to crave your indulgence. Please get on Amazon, get your copies of these books and eat quickly because the work of the king requires haste. My name again is Peter Odioni Puga. I'm signing out now till I see you again. Shalom and remain a possession of Christ. Bye bye now. <laughs>